Hello everyone, welcome back to Pencils and Lipstick. This is episode 188 and we have an interview today. Even though I told you that July would be interview free, but Jeff Elkins, a friend of mine who lives just across the river, um, he has a new book coming out and it's for writers and it's about dialogue, which some writers find very difficult and some writers find easy, but we could all get better at. So I wanted to bring him on to talk about his book um, and we are going to go straight into it. So here is Jeff Elkins. Welcome back everyone to Pencils and Lipstick. I am very excited to have my friend Jeff Elkins with me today. He has written a new book called The Dialogue Doctor. We'll see you now. I love this. I love how we were talking about you. You're like, I'm so serious. Obviously you're so serious that you called your book. <laughs> <laughs> the Dialogue Doctor, we'll see you now. Oh, I had so many long titles that were like, you know, how to uh, write dialogue and characters that will engage readers and you know, improve your writing. And I was like, these are just dumb and boring. And so I, I asked my wife, I was like, what do you, what should I name this? And I she's love like, that. you should call it the something about the dialogue doctor. I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. She's like, you have this, you have this brand. You've like built this podcast. You should use it in the title of the book. I was like, oh yeah, that, that works. Yeah. So yeah. that people know who I am. <laughs> yeah. So that people like when they go to buy it, they're not like, who's Jeff Elkins? It's like, oh yeah, the dialogue doctor. Okay. I know that. Yeah. yeah does anyone know your name? So if, if nobody knows you, obviously your name is Jeff Elkins, but actually your name is the dialogue doctor. Right? The, na the name is the dialogue doctor. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm Jeff. Thanks for having me on, by the way. <laughs> I appreciate it. Of course. So we wanted to talk about this book, but before we get into it, um, why, who are you? So that, you know, how did you become the dialogue doctor? <laughs> who, who am I? Isn't this who like the you, existential Jeff? question we all struggle with forever? <laughs> who Let's am go I? Through. Yeah. Let's go through a um, deeper question. Of that's life. right. I was, I was about to say, I know a, uh, I know an old poem from my theology days. I know an old poem by Dietrich Bonhoeffer that like, is very sad and serious. He wrote it from a Nazi in internment camp called oh, Who geez. Am I? I will not quote that right now. <laughs> um, so <laughs> who am I? I am uh, keep I'm things the, lighter, Jeff. Keep things lighter. Okay. All right. We gotta be here positive. Um, I am the author of 12 novels. Um and uh I started coaching writers uh in 2020. And since then I've done over 200 one-on-one -on -one sessions with writers, coaching sessions with writers, which is a badge of honor I am proud of, which That's is why awesome. I bring it up. Uh, I podcast and coach as the Dialogue Doctor. Um, trying to think of what else you need to know about me. We, I, you know, I don't know. We talk a lot about dialogue. Um, but yeah. I'm, you do workshops. I've had you do doing workshops. workshops I do master classes. I have a master mm -hmm. class coming up in August that's going to be fun. It's... Um, four and a half hours on the Enneagram. Uh, Ooh, we're going to cool. do, we're going to do the first half hour. I'm going to introduce everybody how to use, talk about how to use the Enneagram to create unique character personality and voices. And then we're going to spend the next three and a half hours talking about how to use those voices to develop a cast and like to build a character growth arc in your book. So that's, that's going to be awesome. fun. That's the kind of that's the kind of crap that I do at the Dialogue Doctor. We like go deep into dialogue characterization, character growth, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, which is yeah. important. Like I was telling you before, I just came back from the self-publishing show in London and there's a lot of fantasy writers, right? Whether it's fantasy romance, fantasy, <laughs> fantasy, sci-fi, but they yeah. have huge casts of characters and yeah. all of them said um at some point like the importance of having each character sound different was mm -hmm. just, was key it's, it's huge yeah and lining up cast personalities is super important like you know i don't think i when we look at like master works and like master writers even like master screenwriters because i find that it's easier sometimes to talk movies because people they have more familiarity with the same movies so if you think about like master like big cast screenwriters like james gunn who put together like the guardians of the galaxy or put together mm -hmm. the suicide squad like he is a master of these like you know six to seven person casts it's not just about having different voices it's about understanding how those voices combine and what they do in the in a scene together so like if you take like you know, two shy characters and put them in a scene together, you're going to have a very reflective and quiet scene. If you right. take a commanding character with a shy character, you're going to have a, a 
uh, a scene where the power imbalance feels weird, mm. right? If you take a kind of us, uh, well, and since we're talking fantasy, because these are super popular in fantasy, you take a like lone wolf snarky character. Like that's kind of the like fantasy sci-fi bread and butter is like, you know, right. she's, she's, she's got a big axe and she's super capable, but she, you know, she goes it alone um, and she makes 80s references and jokes. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> you take that, like that kind of like snarky lone wolf character. If you put them with a shy character, it feels the scene's going to feel weird. Because right, the you know, shy character absolutely. is going to disappear behind the bigger personality. So, like, you have to know, like, okay, if I got this snarky, you know, lone wolf, then I probably need someone who's sarcastic and but craves community. Mm. And then I probably also need somebody who's a little dense and, like, can't quite catch what's being said. So... Right. But maybe has a big ego. Well, so now you've put like Rocket, Drax, and Star Lord together in a in a scene, and that's and you gotta love Drax and Star Lord. And that's funny, right? Like when you put those three characters together because you've balanced the personalities, you've understood how to combine the characters. Um, you get that you get comedy, right? Like right. that's why all of the comedies we watch nowadays are since really Seinfeld and Friends are these big casts. Because they know, like, hey, this making funny is much easier if I just throw the right personality combinations in a room. Right. Oh, that makes yeah. sense. And after you've written a cast for a while, like, you know, you can get half a book done. And if you're, if you have strong personalities and you understand how their character voices sound and work, you'll start to get like, like a lot of authors I coach will be like, okay, I need a dramatic scene here. So I need characters A, B, and C in this scene. And I need to get D out of there. Cause if D is in the scene, it screws it up because their voice doesn't fit in the drama. But yeah, I think um, the best, if you really want to look at this, like I think the best ones to look at right now are the superhero movies that come mm -hmm. out because they have such big casts. So like, Marvel is great at it too, especially in their like Avengers movies. They know what characters to put in what scenes to make scenes draw emotion. So like, you know, when Iron Man is dying, you have 20 choices to come and kneel down next right. to him. Right, right. Right. The right choice is you have to put his wife next to him, but she's not the right choice because no. she's stoic and strong. She's just going to hold his hand while he dies. That's not right. Moving. You get the innocent, naive kid who yeah. is, has verbal diarrhea and you put <laughs> that character next to him. Right. And now the entire movie theater is crying. Right. right. Like, and right. that's, that's like what understanding cast and personality does. Um, which we actually, I actually go into a little bit in the book. I touch on it some of the book is um, we talk about engine anchors and vehicle characters and, and hazards and like starting to understand how characters connect to each other as you're developing a plot line uh, and as your character develops character growth, starting to like, so vehicle characters are the characters that you're following through the book. They're the characters that like you're, readers emotionally connected to most typically the point of view characters because they're the ones whose like story we're following okay you're gonna have next to them engine characters engine characters are characters that um encourage positive growth in okay. your vehicle character so they like make your character go that's why we call them engine characters or anchor characters are characters that weigh your vehicle character down and make them want to be the worst version of themselves and so they're anchor characters. So if you think of like talking romance, if you think of like Bridget Jones' diary, in the movie, she's got two options. She's got Colin Firth or um, Hugh, Hugh Grant. Grant. Yeah. And Hugh Grant is an anchor character. Whenever he's around, he encourages her to be the worst version of herself. He's always right. lighting up her cigarettes. He's always telling her not to speak her mind. He's always questioning what she wears and makes her feel self-conscious, right? Like, even though he's the fun boyfriend, he's the boyfriend that like, makes her revert to her self-conscious nature that she's trying to get over whereas colin firth is the engine character now she doesn't get along with colin firth like she does with hugh grant colin firth isn't as exciting and fun as hugh grant is in fact most of the time when she's around colin firth they're fighting 
But when she's with him, she speaks her mind. She says exactly what she means to say. She has the confidence she always wants to have. And she's never smoking around him. So it's this I like, okay. it's this like engine and anchor of like these two characters. If you want a scene where Bridget is empowered to be her best self, put her with Colin Firth. Put her with, Dar I think his name's Darcy because we just keep writing bit, Jane Austen over yeah. and over again. Put her with Colin Firth, right? Like if you want a scene where she is um, going to be self-conscious and going to fail, right? put her with Hugh Grant. Right. Like, and that's, it's understanding those kind of like character relationships so that you can navigate yeah. through your plot. So do you think one of the, the biggest mistakes we make as writers is not really understanding the need for that? I mean, I, I don't know if you hear it all the time, but like the artistic idea um, side of us thinks that there shouldn't be a mathematical side almost, you know, like. Mm, that's interesting. I think, I don't think of these as necessarily art versus math. I think of these as like tools which is we should i just yeah, wonder which, how many it's like the yeah. newbie writer thinking i'm just gonna write whatever i want but a lot of times the characters we want to write i don't know if you see it i see a lot of characters from the beginning being who they should be at the end <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Have no, to tell I'm, my, yeah i'm with my, you my writers know okay they have to be weak at the beginning and they have to be <laughs> at the end you know or like yeah. i guess if your anchor character he needs to always be an a-hole. He is well, not always. Like sometimes your anchor character can be the nice guy, right? Like, and that's, that's true, why we that's use true. engine and anchor instead of um ally or protagonist or, or villain, antagonist right? or villain. Yeah, because yeah, engine and like because you know, I mean, for example, um in the Batman movies or in the Batman saga, even in the books and comic books, his anchor is typically um someone he's trying to save oh interesting okay. because they want him his engines are always his villains his villains make him the best version mm. of himself his anchors are usually the people that are like well so like the heath ledger batman movie which i think everybody saw um his his anchor is harvey dent the like other the prosecutor who's like kind of encouraging him to take to move into tactics and do things that he doesn't you don't want him as the as the viewer doing right like right, right so right. a lot of times especially in like young coming to adult novels um well so i just read uh, as the dialogue doctor community we just read the hate you give by angie thomas as our book mm -hmm. club book we do a we do a book we do a uh we do a twice a month call and we're always reading short stories and books and that was the one for this month but um, in her book, the anchor characters are uh, stars, the lead character, and the anchor characters are stars, two friends from school. Mm -hmm. And they're yeah. they're not villains, right? Like there are villains in the book. There is a, you know, gang lord that's causing all kinds of problems. There's police that are causing all kinds of problems. Those are like in the plot, when you're thinking about the plot, those are the antagonists. Her friends are actually the anchors when she's around these friends she's the worst version of herself she doesn't, okay that's yeah. interesting so you're talking like this this maybe crosses over into plot sometimes but not always not always and so there's a thing i mean ideally all of these things align right like ideally your plot aligns with your character growth and your genre conventions and your theme and so i think part of this going back to the tool analogy part of this is like and going back to like new writers do new writers need to know all of this at once? No. Does a writer need to know this at all? Like, no, there's natural writers who can just, this stuff just comes out of them. They sit down, they write a book and you're like, oh my gosh, the themes are amazing. The character growth is astounding. The plot is yeah. um, expected yet surprising. And right. somehow you hit all of the genre conventions, right? Like, you know, go write another one. Great job. But for the rest of us, we're going to be strong in a couple areas and then and then we're not going to understand our tools and others so right 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 i think about like my kid um who's 20 now who's a really fantastic artist um he helped me do the cover for the book actually but he's when he was you know first learning to do art beyond just doodling in the sketchbook he was really big into like pencil like he really liked pencil drawings because it was what he was comfortable with. But then he wanted to do something that like would require more. So he moved to charcoal and it was like, oh, this is a new tool I have to learn. This is a new thing mm -hmm. I have to learn to play with. 
and then he wanted to do something with like color and like you know more dynamic so he started moving into painting and you know he tried to play with watercolors and he hates them he's like i don't this i don't have enough control over these so he moved into like oil painting right like mm. but as he progresses what i what i watched was him like finding a tool and learning a tool right like right, right. you know were his pencil drawings better than his paint or vice versa i don't know they're just different right like yeah. and he's learned a new tool and it gives new texture to his work and like it's the same as us as authors like as we go i hope we're constantly learning new tools and so yeah. you know usually plot and genre conventions are the first two you learn um yeah. and i think that you ask well, like what mistakes a lot of authors make i think the mistake i see authors making a lot are like okay as long as i hit the genre conventions i'm gonna have a good book mm. and that's not necessarily true you can hit the genre, and i guess good is a term that we need to define like if you hit the genre conventions you advertise it well you have a great cover you will sell that book is that book a good book is anybody gonna pass it to their friends is anybody gonna be like no uh, is that what you're not necessarily is that what you're are you just going to sell or are you going to like write something that like gets passed around and people cherish and love like you know it doesn't it, neither of those goals are better or worse than the other you just have to decide what you're doing right like right. so that being said like picking up and putting down new tools like you might capture the genre tool oh sorry a lot of that's where i was going a lot of authors i find are like okay if i understand i can google the genre conventions as long as i have these scenes my book is going to be great and it's like not oh, necessarily yeah. Yeah, not no. like you know i've thrown yeah. a couple of those books out <laughs> yeah now your book might and again your book might sell because we need to distinguish right. like great is really about like what your expectation of the book is but these authors come in with like my book is going to be great as in like i'm going to be the next jane austen my book's going to stand the test of time everybody's going to read this for the next you know 50 years and it's going to be amazing and then you know they get a bump of sales they get a nice like you know quick buck and then like the book kind of disappears They're like well why didn't that get passed around why didn't that stay why didn't that have this like last why wasn't this the next to kill the mockingbird well you know you gotta learn you gotta use some more tools besides yeah. just genre conventions and right 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 so part of what you know the book is and what i do at the dialogue doctor isn't necessarily teaching people craft we look at problems and we solve them and the way we solve them is by like trying to understand what tools do we need to solve this problem? Like, so, yeah. you know, with genre conventions, part of the thing that we've started, this isn't in the book, but part of the thing we've started talking about is like, what are genre conventions? Well, if, if the story is an emotional journey that readers are going on, because that's what story is. Story is an emotional journey, whether it's, a, you know, an audio story or a, a visual story, like a movie or TV series mm -hmm. or, um a, an imaginative story like a book which i call a book an imaginative story because of uh, robert mckee uh says in his book dialogue that you know the book is the only one of the few vehicles left that puts you in direct connection with the consumer of the story whereas right, like right when you're making a movie or when you're making a radio program you've got producers and you've got directors and you've got mm -hmm. actors and you've got all these people in between you and the consumer of the story it's more a team effort writing a book you know depending on how involved your editor is <laughs> writing a book really does put you in direct connection with the reader's imagination so right right you only have the ink and the paper to the ink and the paper and the, the person listening all that to say like genre conventions if the book is an emotional journey that connects directly to the reader's imaginations genre conventions be the expect the emotional expectations that reader expects when they're coming to the book so like yeah. romance readers have certain emotional expectations when they're coming to the book they're like these scenes need to make me feel this way right and that's so now that you know that you have the freedom to meet them or surprise the reader by playing with them yeah. because if you know how the reader wants to feel when they're reading your book you now have the ability to manipulate the reader a little bit yeah that's that's an interesting way to there writing is so much more complicated than we sometimes think it is but you're making me think of a a book and i it was a it was kind of a romance book i guess 
I guess that was the genre it would go into. But I knew that the writer was trying to make us feel um, sad, but hopeful. Like she was yeah. the main character was trying to get over the death of her husband, you know. And, but I think what was missing in that book is a difference in voice in the characters. And there was no like, like you're kind of cheering for people, but it was more a reliance on the plot rather yeah. than um, what you're saying where like, um, I was telling people like this just isn't believable, but I think it's more the the terms you're using. She, what she needed was an anchor. She needed yeah. to have somebody pulling her back into the sort of lonely, yeah. I'm alone. My you know my one mm -hmm. chance at love has 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 died. gone. Yeah, and then more of an engine. It, maybe that would have made because it just kind of felt like this we're just spiraling. Yeah, yeah. Just sort we're of just like, circling around. Is this yeah. worth my time? <laughs> Yeah. And part, part two of what we talk about, what I talk about in the book and what we talk about in the community is that like a scene, um, and I, this is actually, if you were, I'm going to retract my previous statement. If you're going to ask me what writers get wrong most often, it is, they think a scene is a plot point. Uh, okay. A scene is not a plot point. A scene is a group of characters interacting. Mm. Now, if they interact and, and something happens, the something that happens is the plot point, right. but you have to start with the characters interacting. And oftentimes when a book feels like it's spiraling, it's because the author is trying to get things to happen, but doesn't understand that those things only happen when characters interact. Yeah. So you get chapters where there's a lot of like sitting and like one person reflecting on something or like yeah. long memories of like, Oh, this. And as the reader, you're just like, okay, what is happening here? Like, why do I need to keep, can I you skim feel this? Like they're talking a lot. You the, feel, you, yeah, but they're, they're not, they're it's not, like... they're just reflecting. They're just, and it's like, okay, have the characters interact yes. around a conflict. Right. Ideally that conflict is going to accomplish something in the story. Right, and what right. the plot actually is, is it, so like as we're redefining tools, when we talk about plot, what we're talking about is like things that happen on the journey of the character's growth. Mm. But a lot of times what we do is we're like, okay, I understand genre conventions and there's a lot of books about plot. So I'm going to hit my genre conventions and I'm going to follow like the hero's journey. And I'm just going to hope that the character grows. <laughs> Yeah, you're kind of relying yeah. on your imagination at that point. Of like, yeah, I, you're like, I'm gonna please. hope that I know what I'm doing. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, cooking. We're like, okay, I've got potatoes here and I've got flour and I have a frying pan. So I'm just gonna put them all in there yeah. and hope that whatever happens is edible. And it's like, well, it probably like potatoes are great. And if you put them in oil, something will happen, right? Like it'll, right. it'll be it fine. It might be edible. It, it might, might be, be edible. Horrible. It might be amazing. It might be terrible, but like, so we can get more strategic about our success. Right. And, and actually can you like replicate understand. it, right? Yeah. That's and we can understand fun. our tools and, you know, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what, you know, I, my personal mission as the dialogue doctor is like, Hey, let me create tools that can help you solve the problems you want to solve. So you can tell the story you want to tell. Okay. And right. so, and, and, you know, to anyone writing, let's just, I went back and reread, re-listened to the Harry Potter, like everyone gets better as you go, right? Oh, yeah. Like, let's just, you've, you've said, yep. you know, do we have to know this all at once? It's hard to know all of this. At you, once. you can't, you can't know it all. You have to get good at it. You have to get so good at a tool that using it is not yeah, even thinking. It's, yeah. It's like, yeah, just reflex. Right. So who do you help? Do you help people from the beginning? Do you mostly help people in the middle? In the end, what? I would I say know. that, yeah, I would say the dialogue doctor community is actually all in above. And they're okay. like, you know, what we do with coaching, and I say we because there's three of us now that do coaching, but okay. what we do with coaching is we kind of assess where you are and we're like, what do you want to learn? What do you mm. want to work on? And okay. then, you know, we read your work and we're like, okay, let's work on this. And a lot of times people are like, the, usually the starting place is character voices. Like, oh, people tell me all my characters sound the same. Like, okay, well, that's something we can work on. And like this in the Enneagram class, it, the master class we're going to do it help, is going to help a lot with that. Cause we're going to talk about like, what are the, what does it mean to have different sounding character voices? And so right. we use a tool we call the dialogue Daisy that like helps you understand character voice. And, um, and that's in the book too. And then we use a tool, then we use a like character voice chart that helps you like, just think about your character voices differently. Mm, okay. And then, then, you know, I would say once you start getting character voices, the next stage in that is like, okay, how do these characters interact? Yeah. 
and specifically like how do voices modulate to express emotion or change right like so right. once you've got a character voice down again like once you master a tool you can start playing with it to do fun things with it so like once you understand that spider-man in his normal scenes is uh plucky and anxious and uses jokes to um situate himself in a world where he feels like he doesn't belong right like so once you have the voice of like i'm telling one-liners and I am uh, occasionally panicking in my voice. My phrases are pretty short, sentences are pretty light, and I don't talk about myself very much, right? Like once we have like Spider-Man's voice down, when we need him to destroy the consumer of the story as Iron Man dies in front of him, now you know how to modulate his voice. Jokes go away. Yeah. You keep those sentences short, but he can't quite finish them. Right. He's still not going to talk about himself. He's going to talk about what's happening. Yeah. But he's going to like panic. And it's you're going to keep that, you're going to rev that anxiety up a thousand fold. And now the, because the reader knows what he normally sounds like, or because the viewer knows what he normally sounds like, the viewer goes on this emotional journey with him because we've modulated his voice to this big extreme. So the, the, the viewer feels that modulation, right? Like, and that's what happens in our books too. Like, I was talking about the hate you give with Angie Thomas. She, her character star, the theme of the book is like, how do you interact in this world, in these worlds? Because her 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 character star stands in two worlds. I would say the theme is like, um, how do you bring justice into these two worlds? What's the appropriate way to do that? And what should your voice be? And star is constantly in both worlds in the world of like the private um suburban wealthy high school she attends and the inner city um you know lower socioeconomic class neighborhood she lives in right. it's like she has two voices she modulates her voice for each world um as the book and she's trying to figure out who she how should her voice sound and she, as the book goes on, she starts confusing the two worlds and she uses a voice in one world that actually belongs to the other. And by doing, by confusing the modulation of her voice as the reader, we really start to feel the trouble that she's going through. Right, right, And right. what's funny is that Angie Thomas will actually comment on it. She'll be like, oh crap, that was my other, that was the voice that was supposed to be in my in my home community or like oh crap i'm talking like i should at school right like so she's like her character what the reason i'm using this example is because her character like openly Recognize struggles it. with it like okay. it talks about like oh my gosh my voice is modulated in the wrong way she doesn't use the word modulation but then at the end the big climactic scene you know she takes to the roof of a car with a bullhorn yeah and has a it finally discovers her voice and it's a voice of like strength and confidence and honesty and it's this like first authentic expression where she's not worrying about what she's going to say she allows herself just to be in the moment and to like experience all of the emotions she's felt through the whole book so it's that like voice right. module like uh, once you understand character voice then you can start playing with modulation and once you get the modulation down now you've got two really powerful tools to take your reader on a journey um, right. And that climax probably wouldn't be the same if she hadn't. If she did, if that, she right? hadn't, if, if Angie Thomas didn't understand when she was writing the book that this is about star fight. I've never talked to Angie Thomas, but I actually asked if I could talk and she was like, they're like, she's not doing interviews right now. I'm like, oh, well, put me on her list. Um, <laughs> but if she didn't understand that the voices that star's voice had to modulate and that part of what star struggle was going to be was finding her voice then that final scene isn't as powerful right. but because the theme has aligned with the character growth and the character growth and the plot points have worked out beautifully to take us to this moment to like you know the the points along the road have worked out to take us to this big emotional climax when the voice modulates all of the tools kind of work together and you're like oh this is a this right. is a powerful moment and like that's you know, it, but again, the key is like, not that you have to master every tool, but let's yeah. master some. Yeah. And so that as you master them, you can, 
use them in a, you know, in a powerful way. And again, can you write a powerful story without thinking about any of this? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, but I feel like yeah. the more you write almost, the more, the more the expectation of the reader, I always tell people the more that you can do on purpose, the easier for you. Yeah. We become kind of one trick ponies, right? Like if we, if we're not constantly improving how we do things, if we're not like studying our tools, if we're not understanding like, okay, I need to pick up a new tool. I need to play with this tool a little bit. We become kind of like, yeah, this is what I do. Like, right. this is the thing that I do. And again, yeah. there's a lot of authors that have had great careers around. This is the thing that I do. Sure. So if yeah. You can, yeah. And it really, like you said before, um, at some point it's like, what do you want to do? I mean, I've had, um, people who are not writers comment to me like how can people read like fantasy over and over or romance over and over and really the way that you can do it because there's a lot of well-written books is because they take the tools yeah and they take and the, the genre the expectations yeah. and they twist them and they and know they how them. to use it and they know right? how to play with them and they know how to make them like you know surprising expected and surprising Right, right, like which is right. the goal which of which is what we love. Like that's yeah, what humans we love, love about story. Mm -hmm. We love it. We're like, oh, I thought Why it was going to go this John way. John Wicks. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, we can't stop. There's an emotional journey there that we absolutely love, and we. I was talking to my my boys last night because they wanted to watch a movie. I've um three teenage boys in the house right now. They wanted to watch Man. a movie, and I was going to bed, and they were trying to decide, and I was like, uh, they they wanted like an action movie. And I was like, well, why don't you try to watch Extraction? I was like, that's a new one on Netflix. That's like, well, it's not new. It's a couple of years old, but the yeah, sequel but just came out. out yeah. So I was like, <laughs> why don't you watch Extraction? And they were like, what's it like? And I was like, huh, it's like John Wick, but it, it grittier. And they're like, oh, but it's that like, I've taken a specific genre yeah. and I've turned it a little bit and given you like a new perception of it but and that's what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to like be like okay i'm i know how to write a john wick or i know how to write an extraction now i'm going to take it and make it smooth yeah. and maybe a little humorous which is what i would say right. john wick does right? right like or i'm going to take the genre and i'm going to make it gritty which is what extraction does right like right. i'm going to make it and it's that um you know again understanding the tools of like what we're using part of the reason i keep caveating and i should say this of like you know it doesn't there's no right way to do this is because i don't want anybody to feel judged right like sure. my my we deepest all, we always feel judged. i know this is this is hard enough right like the last thing you need is some dude who's like i'm a doctor but i don't have a phd walking around making you like you have to pick up all these tools like that's the worst so i don't want anybody to feel like this is stuff you have to have like you can tell great stories just from your gut you have them in you well i bet if you think about it because i'm thinking now as you know my mind thinks of millions of things um yeah i know exactly who my anchor guy is in my in yeah. the novel i'm working on i know exactly who my engine character is oh but now that I know that and they have a specific name, I can go, oh, okay, now I know yeah. exactly how he should act and mm -hmm. she should act. And now that you and know it, should, yeah. Yeah. And you look at a scene that's not working. You're like, this scene, there's something in my gut that tells me this scene isn't working. Yeah. The gut ones are the worst because you're like, what? What's <laughs> what wrong? But now, <laughs> once you know your tools, you're like, oh, I'm using the wrong tool here. Right. Right. Like, right. I'm using the wrong tool in this place. I need to use a different tool. Yeah. Or like something in my gut that I want this scene to be funny something in my gut says this isn't funny well you've put the wrong characters in that scene right like you need drax you need drax yeah you need drax <laughs> to make it fun star lord and rocket just hack each other off right like we really need nebula standing there to be for this scene to be funny you gotta have that third ingredient right like and it is like cooking it's like oh this is too acidic what is wrong well you gotta add something that has more of a base to it to like smooth out the, the flavor like it's that kind right. of like but if you don't know that that's how flavor palettes work then you're just like i don't know add more yeah. salt right like, so <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. It, it's fine or more and sometimes it taken. sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't so it, but it is about like empowering like understanding our tools is about empowering you yeah to be I able to so. connect to the reader in how you want to do it right yeah, yeah. i i mean i think it, the more that you do things on purpose the less you will take it personally if somebody doesn't like it. 
I think. It's like, yeah. Well, oh, well, I was trying to do this. So the fact that you don't like it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But actually, I was exactly trying to do that. So I'm I'm pleased with it. Like, I just think that writers are empowered, like you say, when they know these things, they do it on purpose. Yeah, we might do it better or worse than other people. But at least it's not like, I mean, we can go on that downward spiral after 10 reviews come in and they all say something different. And we're yeah. like, now what do I do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think part of what I've loved most about coming to understand my tools as a writer is that it, it it really enhances my reading yeah like i was reading a um john grisham book uh today he's got a new book of short stories out and i he did this thing in the middle of one of the short stories where he transferred the pov from one character to another Ooh. over a phone call Ooh, and i was like tricky. damn way to go like and so i think once we understand our tools and like we understand how point of view like i i caught it because i've been really focusing on point of view lately because it's a problem we're having in the dialogue doctor community like a lot of writers are like can we talk about point of view so i've been thinking about point of view lately and focusing on point of view lately and when you switch and how you switch and how those switches work and how you like bring the reader along to those switches if you're going to and um yeah. I, so I don't think if I hadn't have been really trying to understand that tool that I would have noticed what he did. It would have seemed just like something that happened in the in the story. But understanding tools helps us really appreciate what other people are doing in their work. Yeah, that's and so really yeah, I I saw it this morning. I was at my kids were at a swim meet, and the worst part about swim meets is that like they swim and then there's like, you know, 20 minutes of just waiting for their to eat. So I was like sitting in a chair reading, reading the book and it happened. I was like, oh, look at that. Look at what he did right there. So and you want to tell everyone. Like, I do. Hey. I was like, look at her. I was like, where the, I actually put it on the dialogue, Dr. Slack. I was like, I hey, did this thing because, um, because they'll appreciate it. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, but I think there's a, I think for me, coming to understand tools is a celebration of like, yeah it's a joy of like let's look at what we can do and what's possible and this stuff it's like you know i think it, it does remind me too of like good chefs like like you were saying like i've had i've known some great chefs and they've made things for me and i'm like oh i don't like it it's bitter and like well it's supposed to be better yeah exactly <laughs> and they didn't get their feelings that. hurt they're like oh yeah you know that's what i was that's what i wanted it to be i was like well mission accomplished i don't like bitter things they're like okay <laughs> I won't serve you that again, but it's that like, yeah, it's that like that they knew what they were doing and how to create it. And I like, mm -hmm. as I've cooked more, I've come to appreciate like, oh, what they were doing to create that bitter thing was actually really hard and I can't yeah. do it. And like, yeah, yeah. you start to understand like uh, why we call masterworks, masterworks, like why they stick around for like what well, I was teasing about Jane Austen, but what Jane Austen does in Pride and Prejudice is really hard it's like what like, she did in that book is amazing and you're just yeah. like oh and she has her anchor, anchor and engine characters and she has the in a time where books weren't necessarily dialogue centric but were very um heavy into description yeah. she has a book that's like massively full of character interaction and yeah. it's it's so impressive it's like yeah this is what you know and you're thinking about like filling a book with character interaction like that before visual media was a big deal is shockingly impressive it's like this is something that she and that's why that book stood the test of time because where we she understood tools in a deep way and as we come to understand them we read her work and it's like oh it's not just that this has a good plot it's that there's really great craftsmanship happening in this piece of art that she made right yeah. right so you mentioned that she has a lot of dialogue. So why, and you are the dialogue doctor, <laughs> why do you think, um, I've heard you talk before, why dialogue is important in your in your books? There's a couple reasons. Like, was it you that says like the the majority of the top, the chart topping books has like 80% of what, I don't want to miss. Yeah, that. so back, back in like 2020. Heavy on dialogue, right? They are. Back in 2020, when I was, first right before i started the dialogue doctor i had all these assumptions and i was like i i need to test them like i need okay. to look at them so i started taking just like what people think of as masterworks and not like oh these are 
you know, high literary fiction. Like, not like, oh, I'm going to go find James Joyce and just, but like American Gods by Neil Gaiman. We all have him on the shelf, but we've never actually finished his stuff. never actually finished his stuff. Yeah. (laughs) But like American Gods by Neil Gaiman or like The Road by Cormac McCarthy or, um, uh, you know, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I looked at, um, uh, uh hail mary by andy weir and like these books that we just celebrate we're like oh my gosh this book is above and beyond and i just took a highlighter and i was like every time characters are interacting which is dialogue characters interacting is dialogue i'm gonna highlight it and every time i get exposition which is usually looks like a paragraph but it's descriptions or reflective material or um you know, a summary of action. Mm-hmm. I'm going to highlight it in a different color. And without fail, books that we love are 60, 70, 80% dialogue. That's, without I fail. I mean, that makes sense though, right? Because it's not yeah. tiring to see something, to, to see somebody come into an idea or a realization or make a decision through dialogue. Like it's not, yeah. it, it, it's well, like, that's what we show up for like we're showing yeah. up for the character interaction that's what yeah. as readers we're coming to imagine characters interacting with one another and that's what happens in dialogue and so we're coming in a better way to probably say it to help people understand this we're coming to experience a moment oh, that's what like we want that. yeah. yeah yeah we're coming to live in a scene right like so right. we talk about it um or i talk about it at the dialogue doctor as like there's a you know well this is a good example the first time i took my teenagers to new york city we took the ferry over from new jersey and we're on the ferry and we're looking you can take in all of manhattan you can see like all of these buildings and they look far they're far away and it's awe inspiring and right. it's um it it's uh you know majestic in some ways you're like wow look at you know this giant creation of humanity over the ages look at what we've done like this is insane like this is wild all of these buildings they reach so high they're so big and you're kind of taking them all in that's what exposition does good exposition pulls you back brings you to a moment of reflection helps you kind of feel outside of the moment Mm. and you take in big things right Dial, but when we got into the streets, when the ferry landed and we walked a couple blocks, and now we're like in the middle of New York City, and there's smells, and there's sounds, and there's you know texture to stuff like you know you can touch the buildings and you can see the people walking around, and there's action in front of you, and there's things happening, yeah, (laughs) and all of it, like it's all happening. The dog poo, and the yeah, and we went to Bryant Park, and we like you know ate black and white cookies, and we looked at all the people, well you know we people watched the people interacting, and we listened to the birds, and like there we were in the in the life of the city, and there's an energy there, and there's a like a passion there that you don't get when you're looking at it from the ferry yeah, for sure. and be- being in the city is dialogue that's mm-hmm. characters interacting okay and so like you know your reader is showing up to sit in bryant park and eat the black and white cookie while they're watching yeah they want to the be passion in between the your characters just like that's yeah shopping, that's right? what they want to be <laughs> they want to be in it they want to feel like they're in these scenes and like they're in this moment and so you know i think but again these are two tools that we have to come to understand because right. does that mean exposition is bad no, no that means that it, right <laughs> yeah that means screenplay <laughs> yeah that means the majority of your book needs to be dialogue because that's what your reader's right. showing up for and if you have too much exposition your reader starts to skim they're like flipping pages. They're like, why, when do we get back to the characters okay. interacting with each other? When we get into the character interaction, um, you know, you can have too much of it, right? Like there is an yeah. overload of sitting in Bryant Park. We're like, all right, I'm ready. There's an I'm overload ready. of Drex in. Yeah. So Bryant you need, you to, need to take a step back and you right. need to take in and you need to reflect on what's happening yeah. and you need to like summarize what your character's experiencing right like you need these moments yes. you need to dis- describe the room right like it's mm-hmm. things that we have to do to like 
establish so <laughs> yeah to ground our reader in the moment yeah. right like which is what yeah. exposition does really well it zooms out and it's like hey this is new york city right. it's not baltimore it's not dc it's yeah not. this is where we are this is what it is like get ready this is the this is the big apple and then we zoom into the streets and we actually experience it right like so part of what i talk about in the book is when to use exposition and when to use dialogue okay. and okay. We, i talk about like hey these these are the two different tools like this is what they do and so understand that like when you get to breaks in your dialogue which i won't go into detail here but in the book we call them segment i call them segment breaks but when you get to a segment break it's really important to have some paragraphs of exposition Mm -hmm. to back up and be like okay i gotta take a step back and i gotta like let the reader's mind slow for a minute we'll give the reader a breath from okay. the like craziness of brian park like give them a breath to breathe and take it in and now we can go back and it actually enhances understanding that like where to put that exposition and how to use that exposition yeah. in relationship to your dialogue allows you to craft a more strategic emotional journey. Oof. So which when is you, what we want, right? Which we is want. what we want. Yeah. yeah. So when you get to a place where you need to have a big emotional moment, you know, you're going to find that you're going to be using more exposition there because you want to mm -hmm. slow the reader down, slow them down, make them sit in that emotional mess that you just created. Yeah. Right. If you want an action scene, and this is something that writers get long, wrong a lot of times, they're like, okay, I'm going to write an action scene. So I got to write paragraphs and paragraphs of like what they're doing with their arms and legs. Like, no, that makes the reader feel heavy and slow and re reflective. They're not a part of it. Make that action scene feel more like a back and forth. Get their voices in there a little bit. They don't have to be saying full okay. sentences, but just let them vocalize a little bit. Use that, use that action scene or that sex scene as an exchange between two characters, make it feel like people are talking to one another physically and your reader's going to be really into that, right? Like Ooh. it's that kind of like get them in the moment, um, you know, and they don't get into the moment. I say don't, but again, I'm going to caveat with like, can, are there master exposition writers that make us feel present with a, a paragraph of text? Yes, there are. But the tool that what they're doing is they're such a master at this one tool. They're using it in a way that like we would usually use it. So make that action scene, that sex scene, that, you know, feel more like dialogue and exchange between two characters. And right. your reader's going to move into it with the characters, right? Like, right. And I think like you said about your son learning a new tool with art, like writers can also we don't have to start with a novel with this. Like you can write a little novella, you can write a short story, yeah. practicing and honing these tools, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's a scene, a short story is usually one or two scenes maybe. Yeah. And just practicing. And so in this book, is this like a workbook? Is this like, how how do we it, use this book? Is it more yeah. informative? The book is a, is a manual. Okay. Hopefully it doesn't feel like a manual. <laughs> um, each chapter talks about a different tool. Okay. And we start like, hey, this is dialogue and exposition. This is what they're for. This is how you use both of them. Let me show you some examples. And then at the end of each chapter, there's a summary. Like, here's what I want you to take away from these tools. And then there's two exercises. There's a reading exercise right. and there's a writing exercise. Okay. And then, you know, the next chapter, the next chapter is like, here's this, let's break down dialogue. Like, here's the seven different components of dialogue. Like, here are the pieces of it. Okay. Here's what each piece does here's why we describe each piece once you understand what a segment is here's why it's important you know where segments are and what happens mm -hmm. this is a vocalization this is what a vocalization is like this is a this is body language like body language enhances the emotional texture of a vocalization right like so starting to understand like here's what these different components of dialogue do mm. and now you know empowering you to use them strategically yeah so okay. That's what the book, and it's it's short, it's eight chapters. You're going to cover, in the book we cover, I cover, um, sorry, I struggle with we and I because we do have more coaches at the Dialogue Doctor, um, so I never want to like take credit away from them, but I, they didn't write the book, I wrote the book. So, <laughs> the so like I do, yeah, but yeah. So what I go through in the book is we do you know, like dialogue and exposition, like what dialogue itself does. Then we go like, here are the components of dialogue. Then I go to like, once you have the components of dialogue, let's get 
down into like the different types of scenes. And I'm like, so mm -hmm. there's four different ways to start a scene. We talk about like the four different ways to start a scene. Again, knowing your tools, knowing the four ways to start, what each one does to the reader, like and what happens when you don't, when that thing doesn't land with the reader, like, and what the danger of using that tool too much is, right? Like, so here's the four types of ways to start a scene. And then we go into like, here's the, here's the three different types of scene based on the number of cast members in them and how you as the writer need to manage scenes differently when you have different numbers of cast okay. members in the scene sure. and the power and the weaknesses of each size of cast and oh. then then i go into specific character voice and i'm like here's what a character voice is we go through the dialogue daisy um i explain like here's the five components of a character voice and we like break each of those down and then i give you like you know here's i think i do eight here's different eight different character voices and how they'd sound like here's a shy voice here's a commanding voice here's a um bubbly voice here's a unhinged voice here's a so like we just go through like here's all the different like so you can start to understand like oh i can compare and contrast these and then we start putting them together and it's like here's a you know um bubbly uh yet anxious voice right. and like you okay. can start to see how to like combine character traits to build the voice you want to have then we go into modulation there's a chapter on modulation like how to modulate the voices and then we do uh character growth and engines and anchors hazards and vehicles like here's okay. this tool too so i kind of try to take you from like big conception of dialogue down to like let's get small down to like what's actually happening on the page and then do the same with characterization here's the big okay. understanding of what a character voice is and then let's get real small and like how to use it nice i like yeah. that yeah and do we need to read this book before we participate in your workshops no not at all no mm -hmm. okay yeah i would actually say the book is the workshops are like um let's take one thing from the book and go much deeper in it okay whereas the book is like hey let me give you an overview of all the tools the to dial we've discovered in the dialogue doctor okay um you will pre it's one of those things of like i really find you'll appreciate the reading the book is going to so the dialogue doctor community has been going for two years and mm -hmm. we've been there are you know several authors many authors who have been on this journey with me for all two years and we've okay. we're you know routinely communicating around like what our problems are what we're struggling with craft wise like how we can improve our work craft wise i i do a weekly podcast and every other week i like it's just an editing session i have with an author where i'm like let's talk about the tools and how they're being used and mm -hmm. how we can use them differently um so there what this book does is fast forward you two years in the journey oh nice. it's like here's all the language <laughs> up. yeah here's all the stuff we've learned here's kind of the first two years of what we figured out about dialogue working together okay so then we can yeah. come into the community and not feel completely yeah lost. not feel completely lost. not have not have to be like hey you said the word anchor what's an anchor like <laughs> which we don't get a, like we get some but I also tend to over explain everything as you probably noticed in this interview. Um, so there is that, uh, like, it's not that you're going to come into the community and get lost. This is just like a booster shot. A booster and shot. some people don't want to be a part of the community. Like, that's what I found. They're like, hey, look, writing is hard enough and it takes enough time. The last thing I want to do, Jeff, is be on a Slack channel with you. Like, so <laughs> this is also for people who are like, but I want to learn all this your stuff. info. Yeah, so I want to learn this book? stuff, but I don't want to <laughs> listen to you um two years of podcasts to understand it like, i have to say though your podcasts are pretty good like if you oh, you know if people are walking or they just like you have interesting ideas that i haven't heard other people talk about oh thank in, you in in bringing in the dialogue i mean i always use the example of how you say every person that wears a uniform at work should speak differently when that uniform's on their body mm -hmm. yeah like, modulate the voice to the uniform right like yeah. that is an interesting yes like it yeah. just seems obvious when you say it and yet unless you really put it out there it you know it's like lifting weights and unless they tell you how to lift it properly you're just like well, I don't yep. know, do you want to oh great example of that that i saw this week uh the bear season two is out oh. and i'm not going to spare anything i'm not going to spoil anything i love i love 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 that show there are this and this season takes you into 
many of the characters who were like side characters in the first oh, okay. season and you like spend an episode with each of those characters oh. when you're watching pay attention to when they have when they put you new uniforms on okay every character puts on a new uniform and when they put the new uniform on they take on a different persona which is perfect right That's because great. we know what that means yeah. intuitively yeah and you and want your a, reader to just figure it out like to just roll yeah with it. and it, i'm not going to spoil it but there's even a character closer to the end who like his he won't take his uniform off and he's like no this is me i'm this guy now this is what i do uh, i'm this I guy like <laughs> yeah and it's great it's like oh that's perfect like you have put on this uniform and you've modulated your voice you it's like not it. that your personality has changed it's that you've decided well in this case decided sometimes they don't decide but sometimes characters don't decide that it's just a natural reflex but he's decided that this is how he's going to present himself to the world now right, right, his right. personality is the same he's not a different yeah. character he hasn't like changed his personality but he's he's deciding to present himself differently which is character change right like you yeah, don't have to change yeah. a character's personality to show character change they're yeah, that's deciding... a masterful way to do it though right because it's... yeah they're modulating yeah. different aspects of their voice across the story and by if they sound differently from the beginning of the story to the end of the story we go they've changed yeah okay. and that's what you want yeah that's interesting yeah All and right. the bear nails it season two of the bear so great you don't need the book. Change. You just need to. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just gotta go watch the bear. <laughs> just go watch the bear. No. Okay. So where read the people... book, and then you'll appreciate the <laughs> bear ten times it. more. You'll be like, oh man, this is right. It. <laughs> yeah. You'll become me, and I'll be like, it's because he has the most to lose. That's why they made him. Right. My, my whole family's like, shut up. Shut up. Yeah, stop <laughs> ruining this for me. Yeah. No, it is. I and that's what. Like, just going back to what we were saying. Like, it's weird that a show about cooking in a restaurant right like that is a, such a mundane everyday thing cooking right. in a restaurant is that there's no spy thriller to it there's no goblins or gnomes in the first season there's no romance there's nothing that should like make that show be an international hit but the writer of that show understands their tools yeah and yeah. they're like and we want to be like that. i'm gonna show you character growth yeah I'm, you i know the writer of that show knows that like these this character has experienced a deep trauma and tragedy and because of that this is how their voice needs to be modulating awesome. and as they deal with that trauma i'm going to modulate their voice to open them up more to the people around them and as they open up we are all going to be captivated by these intimate moments between and these that's characters what we want to do no matter what genre we doesn't do. matter what genre it is yeah. we love it we're like we're yep. all in for this yeah <laughs> that's awesome so yeah. where can people find the book and um and then when is the workshop again yeah book you can find the book in all places amazon uh barnes and noble kobo go grab it ebook and paperback are out um by the time this drops they'll be out uh the uh and it's called the dialogue doctor we'll see you now um the workshop you can find at dialoguedoctor.com it's happening august 1st okay. um it's gonna it's gonna be a blast you can attend it live which i recommend because mm -hmm. then you i it's it is a workshop so if you attend it live we talk we ask questions we like cover things you get to slow me down and be like wait when the hell did you just say so you're know, like because i'll be like oh yeah it's like, I, just, I just said manhattan versus bride park and now you can like stop me and be like, hey, can you explain that to me? So that's the value of coming live, but okay. you can also just buy a recording of it. Uh, okay. If you if you'd rather be like, I can't come on August first, you can just sure. buy a recording. And okay. Joke. And then and you the dialogue doctor dialogue not the dialogue doctor dot com dialogue doctor dot com. <laughs> yeah, everything's there. Dialogue doctor dot com. You can come find everything. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on. Um, yeah, Kat, thanks for having on me. this book. Thank the you, dialogue doctor. We'll see you guys. Yep. Thanks so much. <laughs>